We have a, uh, uh, someone who is celebrated on the internet uh, here with us today. He's, he's uh, widely followed. And if you look on Wikipedia, you will see a long encomium and a long, long biography. I won't repeat all of it here now, but, I, but I, suffice it to say, the most distinguished thing he's done is he went to Yale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he where he graduated in Summa in Cognitive Sciences, and we, we, we share that background. Uh, I will tell you, I think he did slightly better than I did. Um, and he then came on to the law school here, and uh, where he also did slightly better than I did, knocked the top off the place. Um, and uh, here, at, and got his Harvard Law degree, and as well as an MPA at Penny School. Uh, which it was, I, I hadn't been fully aware of that, I must say. It was, uh, uh, but uh, it's beyond that, he's got, got more titles than check the stick at. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Uh, the Harvard Law School is a professor of computer science at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Co founder and faculty co director of the Berkman Center for Internet, uh, the Internet and Society. So that is a, 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 that's a mouthful. Uh, but he has, he's, he's written a book, well, I love the title of this book, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let him explain that. But uh, I have uh, yeah, been watching with some awe as Jonathan has come to the World Economic Forum at Davos on um, more than one occasion where he has huge following over there. And he's sort of really hot property there. Uh, so that uh, Oxford University persuaded them to come teach there. You, you, you co-teach at Harvard and in Berkeley, right? Uh, Harvard and Stanford. Harvard and Stanford. Yes. Harvard and Stanford. Uh, so you can see he's a, he, he's a man of uh, uh, many, many talents, and he has the gorgeous little girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I met uh, Lauren, uh, I also met along the way. So Jonathan is going to, you, uh, you, you take it away from here. <laughs> <laughs> most complete introduction ever. <laughs> so, um, well, I am really happy to be here. I'm happy that you guys are here. This is a so-called optional session, so I already knew you as the cream of the crop of this class on leadership because we are here on a decent day uh, to talk about leadership in a networked world. And I must say, I feel like I have learned myself so much from David, and that's why I couldn't help but want to uh, join him for uh, an afternoon to talk about these things. I remember actually on one of those trips to Davos, uh, they you land in Zurich, and then it's about a two, two and a half hour bus ride. You get crammed into the same buses everybody else gets crammed into when they get crammed into buses. Um, but somehow, magically, David, perhaps from the Kennedy School or other auspices, <laughs> arranged for a lovely car to take him to Davos. And Don't ask. He was extremely generous in offering me and another professor, whom I didn't know very well, uh, from the School of Education, uh, a lift up to uh, the place. So we had uh, this lovely conversation in the car over the span of about two hours. And it basically comprised me keeping my mouth shut, because what's that aphorism about if you thought a fool, don't open your mouth and confirm it kind of thing? <laughs> and, so I was just there to learn. And uh, this other professor uh, just started asking David question after question that was sort of all meant to get the skinny on what's going on in DC and what stories David could dish about various people. And David obliged with many, many interesting stories that really kept me completely riveted. And it was only after the trip was over that I realized over the course of that two hours, David had been both incredibly informative and had told us so much and had not spoken ill of a single person over the course of that two hours. And that seemed to me possibly an element of leadership that I hope to learn how to speak the truth but not be unnecessarily um, uh, gossip-like in doing so. So anyway, uh, we're here to talk about uh, the internet and leadership, and one way maybe to think about it is to think about it uh, in a sense of how the internet itself is led. So not as much in the opening bid of how to use the internet to lead better in the real world, but some of the factors that make the internet itself so interesting, because I think it ultimately connects up to the moment where we feel leadership has really happened, where somebody who is part of an enterprise says, wow, I am pleased to belong, whether it's casting a vote or any other acts, it's an act of identity with a group, often for which the group has some form of leadership, identified or not, as we'll see as we unpack it a little bit. 
And as long as we're um, in an academic environment, let me share with you how I've been thinking of it, trying to lend some structure to it. And you can tell me, ultimately, if you think this is helpful or not. But basically, I see for a given technology, a given platform, two ways you could slice and dice it. You could ask, for example, for the people who use it, to what extent is it hierarchical versus polyarchical? And for that, I generally mean how much choice does somebody using it have in how it operates? Uh, and if they don't like it, can they choose something else in a reasonable way? And if they can, they're over here, that's polyarchy. And if they can't, they're subject to some kind of hierarchy. And I'm not saying one is good and one is bad. I'm just saying we could divide it up this way. Then I also say we could divide up a technology or a platform or an enterprise as far as how top-down versus bottom-up is it. To what extent is it possible for the people who are affected by the enterprise to directly make changes in how it operates? And if the answer is they have a lot of power to do that, they're probably bottom-up. And if they don't, it's top-down. If there are people who run it, distinct from people who live under it. And we can even, as long as we're in a government zone, start to think about governments around this kind of chart. So an authoritarian government, for better or worse, is probably way up in the top-down and hierarchical, which is why for so many authoritarian governments, it's important for them to have limits on M aggression. They don't want people leaving, even if people would rather be somewhere else, given the system under which they live and for which they don't have much of an opportunity to change it. And you could even put democratic in this category, because honestly, I think most governments fit in this part of the chart. Because democratic governments might be a little less hierarchical in the sense that you can leave if you don't like it. That tends to map to governments that uh, obey the rule of law and aren't authoritarian. And they're less top-down, because there is, democratically, an opportunity to influence what the government does. But I still put them north of this line, because make no mistake, a democratic government, for the most part, has to have a different identification between those who run the show, that person just got sworn in as a member of Congress or the president or the mayor, versus everyone else. You're a citizen, you're entitled to come to the microphone, and every so often you get a moment where you can vote and decide who earns this status in the top, and that creates kind of a cycle here where people down here can affect what's going on up here, but we wouldn't say in a democracy everyone is the mayor. And that's what still keeps it up in this zone. Okay, moving right along, you might put federalists somewhere towards the middle because part of the point of the federalist system in America and elsewhere is said to be, oh, if you don't like it in Massachusetts, guess what? There are cigarettes that are even cheaper in New Hampshire, and you can go and get them without too much trouble, just the car ride back and forth. And a federalist system is meant to create these little incubators of experiments so one state can try one thing and another can try another, and it's movement of people and ideas back and forth that make it a little more polyarchical. There's some choice on that shelf. And speaking of choices on shelves, I put the corporate world, for the most part, over here, because it is polyarchical. In a well-functioning market, there's lots of choice. You go to that shelf in the store, and there are different brands of whatever thing you're looking for, cereal, for example. But they're still pretty much top-down, because once again, we know who works at General Mills and who doesn't. And it's not as if anybody, any customer can say, I'm a customer, I'd like to go in and inspect the plant. It doesn't work that way. There is still this kind of cycle of the sort we saw with democracy where customers can affect what the corporation does because the corporation, after all, wants to have as many and as many happy customers as possible, but it's still indirect rather than we are not sure who runs General Mills or Hershey Foods or any other going concern. Taking a, a continued tour around this little theoretical zone, you might put anarchism, uh, literally absence of government, over in a zone that's both bottom-up and polyarchical. Nobody steps forward to say, I'm running the show. What's the old joke? Um, next week, Wednesday, elections for president of the anarchy club. Old president will be disposed. You know, that kind of thing. It's meant to be uh, a zone where almost anything can happen. And I kind of think in some ways of the libertarian ethos, not as being anarchist, but having for the most part a real concern with having as little influence from up here on what happens is down here. To the extent that you get influence, it's a necessary evil, it's something, okay, we need a national uh, defense kind of thing, but for the most part, let's trust in people to live in the happy and Randian Valley and get along okay and give them maximum choice in with whom they want to interact and what they want to do. And finally, over here, you might put communitarian, with the thought being 
Sometimes, say the communitarians, for the good of the community, there have to be rules, and they will be enforced, but we like to think that there's very little space between the people who make the rules and the people who live under them. We act together as a community. Aren't as many real-world examples of that in the political space, but as you'll see, I think this quadrant turns out to be one of the most interesting in the internet and network space. All right, so with that kind of theoretical introduction, let me now put some ideas on the table as we look at how the internet came about. And I want to say that it's what we would call a civic technology, and I'll define that. Um, this is not a civic technology. This is the AT&T telephone network. It works really well when it was the dominant telephone network. And make no mistake, it's great, but it's a standard technology. If we had to put it in a quadrant on our chart, it would be up here in the corporate quadrant, maybe even towards the left side because there wasn't a whole lot of choice. At a certain time, if you wanted telephone service in the U.S., you were getting it from AT&T. The shelf had one product, and when the shelf has one product, we call that hierarchy because you can't easily walk when it doesn't work, except to the extent that you can say, enough with this telephone, I'm using postal from here on out. That'll show them. And that tended to mean that there would be control exercised by the people who ran AT&T on how the network would be used. In a classic, now celebrated example, in the early 20th century, somebody invented the hush -a phone a very clever little physical object that would go on your handset so that people wouldn't hear you speak. You could say your secrets and people near you couldn't hear them. And uh, uh, it was, you know, one of those things you might buy on TV if they had TV at the time. And uh, AT&T actually went to the FCC to get the Federal Communications Commission to ban them as a danger to the network until they were licensed through AT&T and AT&T got a cut. The FCC agreed with that, and it was only on appeal to the D.C. Circuit in federal court that the D.C. Circuit said, come on, it's an object you put on your rented from AT&T phone no problem, and that was allowed. But that's an example of how capacious the view was of the primary mover in this space, AT&T, about how much control they expected over the network. And there was a similar ethos, now just projecting into the 1980s when you looked at the likes of CompuServe or AOL or Prodigy, where you would be offered a menu of things that were meant to please you, but you couldn't change this menu yourself. And if you had a service you wanted to offer CompuServe subscribers that was news and weather oriented, you weren't entitled to be present when that button was clicked unless you had cut a deal with CompuServe. And in circa 1981, 82, 83, <coughs> this was seen as the future of networking. This was what the future was going to look like. One of, or some combination of, CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, The Source, MCI Mail. But then you get a kind of strange piece to the story. These are three of the framers of the internet. Um, they're pictured here for their 25th anniversary retrospective photo in Newsweek, a very carefully <laughs> composited photo. It turns out they were classmates together at the same high school in suburban Los Angeles. So we had like a French club or a debate club. They had to build a big network club, and it worked really well. Um, and they're showing here you can build a network out of just about anything, except interestingly, the network doesn't work. It goes here from Dave's ear to Vince's ear, and then Vince's mouth to John's mouth which we're hoping it's an inside joke rather than the framers of the internet don't know how to string tin cans together. And then in the middle, you can actually see the initial map of what would become the internet. And even that teaches us something. These guys operated with one major constraint and one major freedom as they tried to build a network that would, through their leadership, ultimately become the world's network. The big constraint was they didn't have a lot of money. This was not a play like FedEx where we say, let's get a bunch of trucks and a bunch of cities and a bunch of people to operate the trucks and move the packages around in a hub in Memphis, and then we'll get a package from anywhere to anywhere overnight. They didn't have money for that. Instead, they said, we're going to design protocols so that various entities that are already got some networking capacity can connect to each other, regardless of their machinery and the kind of network they have. Interoperability is what they were designing and proffering the world. Now, the freedom they had was that they did not aspire to make any money off of this. And that turned out to be crucial to the kinds of protocols they developed that would become the internet. For example, their protocols could allow MIT to piggyback here on VBN because they weren't thinking of cash flow. If you were building this so that as data flowed, you'd like catch a little bit of it, you'd get a nickel off of every dollar or whatever, then you would need to be measuring data flows and who was responsible for initiating them. So, like the phone company, you could charge them for it. Totally reasonable, but not what they wanted. 
And as a result, they did not build into internet protocols any sense, really, of who was using it, what their credit card number was, and how much time they were doing so you could charge them appropriately. That meant that the system they built was incredibly flexible, lightweight, easy to deploy, because it wasn't burdened by the machinery needed to make money. Very, very counterintuitive, especially when you compare it to the stuff that was so popular at the time. And in fact, the protocols as they shaped up were so unusual that as late as 1992, IBM was fond of saying you po couldn't possibly build a corporate network using the internet protocol. It just wouldn't work. <laughs> and the internet engineers have since worn that as a, ba a badge of honor. They say that their mascot, if they had one, would be the bumblebee, because the fur to wingspan ratio of the bee is far too large for it to be able to fly. And yet, somehow, magically, the bee flies. And look at that. The internet works. Um, it turns out, actually, in 2006, they finally figured out how bees fly. Um, it turns out they flap their wings very quickly. So another score for <laughs> government funding of basic science. So the protocols that IBM was so skeptical about, instead of FedEx, say, to get this laser pointer to the back of the room, where we would designate somebody the laser pointer mover, and if it disappeared, we'd know whom to blame, and they would probably demand payment later, we just hand it to this guy. He looks trustworthy. Would you mind? And he passes it there, and he passes it there, kind of the way that beer moves at a Red Sox game. And before you know it, you might be deep in the row, but the beer gets passed, and it gets to you, because that's just the shared norm, the understanding. And then someday you'll be the recipient of the beer. And it may be a little lighter, because it spills on trousers, but you get the beer. In the Internet, this is called best efforts networking, also called send it and pray, or every packet an adventure. And it's kind of the way somebody might, in a mosh pit, surf on top of the crowd to get from one point to another. It's a civic technology. It's accepting um, contribution from anywhere after starting quietly in a backwater, which actually, for leadership purposes, turns out to be really important. If you blew the bugle and said, everybody, come one, come all, we are building the network of tomorrow, and did it from a mountaintop, the worst thing that could happen is people would believe you. Because then they would show up, and it's like, hi, I'm from the music industry. How are we going to avoid copying of our music? That's a legitimate concern. And hi, I'm from the FBI. We need to be able to know who's using it so we can properly punish them if they do something wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And before you know it, you haven't written a bit of code or designed a thing, and you've got a table full of expectant people because this is so self-consciously the network of tomorrow. So backwater, very important. <clears throat> ambitious but not fully planned. Not sure where this is going to go. This is an experiment in networking. Some network engineers say the internet is still an experiment, a pilot project that has turned out really well, but the jury is still out on whether it will succeed. You welcome contribution from all corners. In our example, I don't know who you are. We have not had some accreditation process, but I'm going to trust you with my laser pointer and see if it can get to the back of the room. And then, in many cases, you get success beyond expectation, given those ingredients. The bee flies. Like, whoa, I had no idea the bee could fly. And I can tell a similar story to the displacement of the CompuServes and AT&Ts of the world by the internet, which is a displacement of these things. I don't know how many of you might remember or have seen one of these. This is a brother smart word processor from back in the day. You turn this thing on, and it's like, here's your main menu. Where do you want to go today? And this is an example of a competing product that competed with other smart word processors, upper right quadrant here. And when you bought this one, it would be controlled by brother. Like what this menu is would never change from the time you got it to the time you retired it, but hopefully it would give you years of service and you'd get good papers written. That was thought to be the future of consumer electronics. There was no other category of our interface with IT. It was consumer electronics. This is just like a record player or a CD player. Then in 1977, something changed. This is a 21-year-old Steve Jobs introducing the Apple II personal computer for the first time at the West Coast Computer Fair. Now, this was a fair designed for nerds. This is a computer designed for nerds. You take this thing home, you turn it on after connecting it to your television set, and what you get is a blinking cursor. Talk about ambitious but not fully planned. It is totally useless out of the box. And then you do something like 10, print hello, 20, go to 10, run. And it just says, hello, hello, no, no. And you're like, this is really cool, but can I use it? They had some expectation that someone would be able to write software for this thing, unrelated to Apple, that would make it worth it for people to buy apples. Talk about an amazing 
risk, a bank shot that turned out within two years. Bostonians uh, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston had invented VisiCalc, the first digital spreadsheet ever. Right? There was a time when there weren't spreadsheets. And businesses around the world were like, oh my God, spreadsheets. They wanted to use spreadsheets, which meant they needed Apple IIs. Apple IIs are flying off the shelves. And Apple has no idea why. They had to do market research to figure out that their personal computer had suddenly become a major business tool because the technology was civic. They hadn't planned out exactly how it would be used. Some strangers were able to make use of it and in turn have a profit model. This account wasn't not for profit. But they were able to sell software and Apple just stood back and sold the machines and the operating system. And that mode, right up through the years, is the basis of the personal computer revolution. This model from probably 1992, I don't know, it's pretty old. How would you, anybody recognize what would date this computer? Wouldn't the CD-ROM put it in like at least the mid-90s? Yeah, the CD-ROM puts it in the mid-90s. Anything else? There's a three and a half inch drive there. But there's no uh, five inch, is it five inch? Five and a quarter? I don't see a five and a quarter in this one. Probably. Yeah, and how about that, the 66 light? Anybody remember the 66 light? That was literally how many megahertz the computer was running at. And you could push a button and put it into turbo mode, and all your software would run twice as fast. You'd be like, why don't I run it in turbo mode all the time? <laughs> the answer is the hamsters inside then run too fast, and they get really tired. Which actually turns out they built a hamster-powered paper shredder. You can put the hamster in here, and then it shreds the paper, and then the hamster can live in the paper afterwards. So, very, very Anyway, we digress. The fact is that these computers would run any piece of software you gave it, and you didn't have to be a nerd to stick a floppy disk into that three and a half inch drive. In fact, it wasn't even floppy anymore, which meant it was safer among people that were clueless. So you put those things in the drive, you run software, and what you bought for one purpose could suddenly be repurposed for anything else, which is pretty amazing. And it's what gave rise to the entire off-the-shelf software industry. Right? Without that generative PC, you would never have had tons of people writing software for it that others could choose. So you actually end up seeing lots of different ways in which building something over here, where you're just an individual, you're Steve Wozniak, or you're the guys from the high school in Los Angeles, can become so popular that it actually ends up being over here, and that it's hard not to have a PC these days. And at the time, it was hard not to have a Windows PC, because that's where all the software was. You actually see hierarchy starting to emerge from kind of this quantum foam of people who end up, in some way, exercising a form of leadership. And then what you see, this is kind of the snake in the garden part of the story, by the turn of the century, you've got, whether it's Windows or Mac, huge piles of software running on people's machines, .exe. Nobody knows what the software does. And if you were to say hypothetically, well, what if one piece of software had a line in it that was like, delete the hard drive, what would happen? Answer, the hard drive would be deleted. Like, well, doesn't that worry who about all this software then? I don't know. It doesn't seem to happen. Any more than there are cars racing through the streets outside. Any one of them could hit me. Well, they don't tend to do that, and I guess they'd be caught if they did. So we put that aside until we can't. And that's where the success of a civic technology tends to lead to an influx of usage. But then, precisely because so many people are using it, including people who aren't nerds, there comes a moment where a few bad apples can really spoil things. And those bad apples are just one of the strangers from whom contribution had originally been welcomed. And we see that both for these endpoint PCs and for the network, for which I say both of them have this strange civic nature of their technology. On the PC space, this is from 2007, an account of the storm worm fighting back against researchers who want to destroy it. It attacks them, shutting down their internet access for days. As you try to investigate, it knows and it punishes. It fights back. They're afraid. I've never seen this before. And I'm like, is this Network World or 24? Like, that's crazy. Can you imagine this being true of anything but our PCs? Like, if our refrigerators were warming food at random because they were under attack, 
And you're like, I don't know, I've never seen this before. Just have to hope that you upgrade your fridge to the latest firewall and maybe your food will be safe. Like, really? We accept best efforts in some zones, but in other zones, it's like, no, I want my six nines of quality in my refrigerator. This is my favorite um, actual computer virus. It was in Vista, which had a thing for the disabled uh, and others, where instead of having to double click to open a folder, you could say, open the folder. And it would just open the folder. So nobody anticipated, well, that means you could go to a website. You know how sometimes you go to a website and it just starts playing music and you get embarrassed? Um, if you're in an office or something. So what happens when you go to a website and the website just says, delete the hard drive? And your computer's like, bing, are you sure? I'm like, no, no. And the website is like, yes, delete the hard drive. And you're having a shouting match with your computer about its near-term future. That is a generative device open to contribution from strangers that perhaps has gone too far. Now, the way I try to encapsulate that whole riff is with this, the Cap'n Crunch bosun's whistle. This is a prize in a box of Cap'n Crunch cereal in the early 1970s. After you triggered up your child, why not have her run around the house and blow the whistle? It's a perfect <laughs> prize in the box. But it turned out that if you were to blow into the whistle after covering that hole, it would have been a tone at exactly 2,600 hertz, which was the tone used to indicate by AT&T, Monopoly telephone provider at the time, an idle line. Pick up the phone, blow the whistle, free long distance telephone calling. Boxes of Cap'n Crunch cereal flying off the shelves. <laughs> General Mills has no idea why. Right? They have to do market research to figure out there's a new third-party app for their cereal called Free Long Distance Telephone Calling. And AT&T could fix this because it wasn't meant to be a civic technology. The network was meant to be like the brother word processor. You call, you speak, you hang up. So they did. They fixed it. They made it so that no sound could change your billing opportunities on the network. The internet, however, is still exactly in this place. The very passageways that carry our email, our Facebook messaging, our music, are also the passageways that carry EXE to our computer and to the routers in between. And we wouldn't want it any other way. Because when you click on something, you want it to add new functionality, and that might require running new code. Now, I can tell you the same story metaphorically, happening in the network space. That's the PC space about how these crazy PCs from 1977 are maybe not the best things to have in prime time right now, despite how much I extol their virtues. I can say the same thing about this network that replaced CompuServe, that invites from strangers the passing of the laser pointer. And one example of that is when, um, it turns out a lot of countries try to block various internet sites because they don't want their citizens to see them. No surprise there. I'm part of something called the OpenNet Initiative that tracks this in over 50 countries around the world. So in 2008, <laughs> Pakistan wanted to block YouTube because there was a video there that Pakistan didn't want its citizens to see. So they ordered their internet service providers to stop letting Pakistanis get to YouTube. One ISP in Pakistan chose to implement this block using what I call a parlor trick in how internet routing works. And for that, let's just turn back for a moment to the mosh pit with the crowd surfing. That's not a perfect analogy to how internet data moves, because when you are surfing a crowd at a concert, you don't get to say where you want to go. You can't be like, you know, Harvard Square and step on it. You go where the crowd takes you. <laughs> Whereas your data needs to get to a certain destination. So how does the data know where to go? If I give him the laser pointer, how does he know whether to pass it here or there to get it to the ultimate destination? And for that, you need a map. Now, one way you can have a map of the internet would be to have a designated map keeper, and that map is the map. The guys who built the internet didn't have the money for that. They didn't have the idea of a centralized thing. Instead, they have a constantly <coughs> updated network of gossip. So what will happen is this fellow, for example, can look one person around him. And he looks to his left and sees this guy, and he looks to the woman to his left, and he says, here's who I see on my right. She's too far to see him. But now she knows, thanks to him, what's on the other side of him. And she can tell her friend to the left what he saw on his right and tell him what she sees on her left. And before you know it, by exchanging gossip, we have what's called a distributed routing table, Border Gateway Protocol. Great Nobel Prize-worthy insight. Well, they don't give a Nobel Prize for computer science, so nobody won one. But amazing insight as to how to make this map work. But it's a civic technology. It assumes that each of us will be honest about what we see. And why would you lie? 
Well, here's why you would lie, because you were just asked by your government to block YouTube. So Pakistan Telecom lied. It said to this network, guess what? I have just looked down and discovered that I am YouTube. So its subscribers would send packets meant to go to YouTube, and they would stop right at that telecom because it had said it was YouTube, and they threw them away. The point was to block it. Okay, fine. But that wasn't the end of it. At one moment, you have YouTube working just fine. Within two minutes, that gossip that YouTube was in Pakistan had ricocheted around the entire internet. And if you were sitting in Taubman Hall trying to get to YouTube, your packets were going all the way to Pakistan and not coming back. Now that's really weird. Now within a couple hours it got up and running again in a way that I'll explain later turns out to be pretty amazing. But this is a vulnerability that exists to this day in the internet in which any of the tens of thousands of nodes that it comprises could tell a lie, not just about one site, but at about 10,000 of them. And at that moment, the internet would be in chaos. And at every moment, that's not happening, which is why the internet is still working. I should add, by the way, this trick of just announcing that you are something you aren't, or you're near something you're not, um, this is what caused nearly 15% of the world's internet traffic to go through China for a certain period of time, because China had announced it was near a bunch of stuff it wasn't. And everybody is still trying to piece together what it means. We don't even know if the incident was deliberate. We're just calling it a diversion of data. Really weird how little measurement is built into the internet, because the guys who built it weren't planning to bill anybody for it. Or here's another example of an application, kind of an EXE for the internet, for the web, written by somebody as a good idea that it's amazing what can, without any accreditation or formality to it, become uh, endemic. I don't know, how many people have encountered bit.ly leak, uh, links on their surfing of the internet, yeah? It's a way of shortening links, which nobody realized at first anybody would care about shortening links. You click on them, who cares how long they are? Well, if you want to tweak them, you only have 140 characters, you need them short. So somebody just comes up with Bitly. You visit Bitly, you give it a long link, Bitly gives you back a short one, you hand out the short one in your tweet, and when people click on it, it momentarily goes to Bitly and then goes to the long link and you're all done. As long as Bitly is up and running forever, it works great, because those links last forever. Anybody know what the LY in Bitly stands for? Libya. That's right, it's the Libyan top-level domain, which means that if Muammar Gaddafi has a bad day, he can choose to kill Bitly, and there's nothing Bitly can do about it, in which case he has killed all links that are Bitly links. Talk about the most profoundly unnecessary internet vulnerability ever introduced. <coughs> right? It could have been bit.de, that's a German top-level domain, but then it would be bit.de. And that doesn't work. It needs to be bit.ly. It has to sound like an adverb. And so that's why Muammar Gaddafi gets to say if bit.ly links work. And in fact, um, all of this together has led our governments, major governments of the world, to say there is great vulnerability out there on the network, on the things attached to it. This is one FBI expert saying computer attacks pose the biggest risk other than weapons of mass destruction or a bomb. The experts are warning of, quote, cybergeddon. I mean, that's the kind of level of concern I gather is out there and that I hear confirmed by some of the U.S. government people I talk to really worried about how vulnerable the network is and how likely it might be that any given country could find it to its advantage to take down the website of an enemy, not just block it for its citizens, but just wipe it off the map. And we've seen a few threats of that sort. So now let's just bring it to contemporary for a moment and think about the likes of Julian Assange, who, as Clay Shirky famously said, all he needs is a hairless cat in order to be the perfect James Bond villain. <laughs> and my interest in this is less about the leak, although that's a great topic, and more about what happened after WikiLeaks started offering those State Department cables at WikiLeaks.org and a few other sites. And what happened was, first, how do we stop financing them when the way they earn their money is through t-shirt sales? Like, this is our enemy. They sell t-shirts to finance themselves. Like, just kind of mind-blowing that that's all it takes to keep WikiLeaks up and running. But in the meantime, what we see 
is pressure upon, say, Amazon, which was hosting one of the WikiLeaks sites, and not legal formality, just pressure. Amazon then takes it down. Amazon says, who needs this? We're not going to support WikiLeaks anymore. And other pressure brought to bear on hosts of WikiLeaks outside of America, for which when those hosts refused to take it down under pressure, then the attack started. And we saw a denial of service attacks against every host of WikiLeaks with no sense of who was behind it. Really kind of worrisome from a point of view of order on this frontier. In the meantime, another group then decides to help out WikiLeaks by attacking anybody that was mean to WikiLeaks. So Amazon, which had gotten rid of the WikiLeaks website, gets itself subject to denial of service attacks by Anonymous. And Operation Payback now means there's denial of service attacks going in both directions. Anonymous is a group that has no designated leader. That's its point. We say we are legion, we do not forget, we do not forgive, and anybody that wants to help us is welcome to download this software and run it on their PC called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon and join us in attacking Amazon. And if enough people do it, Amazon runs into trouble. 2600, the Hacker Quarterly, this is the Hacker newspaper, came out with a press release condemning anybody from doing denial of service attacks, including Anonymous in defense of WikiLeaks, under the theory that they're too easy to do and that no self-respecting hacker would just click on a low-orbit ion cannon. It's kind of an embarrassment. And in the meantime, you have a guy named Aaron Barr, not to be confused with Aaron Burr, <laughs> but he meets an end that is metaphorically similar. Aaron Barr works for a company called H.B. Gary Federal, which is a very little-known contractor that sells security solutions to people that have stuff on the internet. We will make you secure. That's their promise. And they're fighting in a world where they need attention so they can sell their products and their consulting. He decides to become higher profile by finding out who is leading Anonymous. And he tells the Financial Times that he has discovered who Anonymous is and is about to out them. And that's why you should hire him, because he's good enough to have figured out who Anonymous is. Within 12 hours of him telling that to the FT, Anonymous had declared him their next target. And they hacked his Twitter, for which he then was forced to tweet his address and social security number. They hacked the H.B. Gary parent website, which just had left a message that says, we've been the victims of an intentional criminal cyber attack. Technical support is still available via email. It's like, I'm not sure I'd be trusting them anymore with supporting my security. In the meantime, the H.B. Gary Federal website that he ran in particular completely hijacked with this message from Anonymous placed there instead, saying that the domain has been seized under Section 14 of the Rules of the Internet. You have charged into the Anonymous hive. You tried to steal honey. Did you think the bees would not defend it? <laughs> <laughs> At the very end of the page, if you scroll down, this little button, download H.B. Gary email leaks. That's right. They cracked the corporate email server. And in fact, if you didn't want to download them, you could just visit this website from Anonymous called non-leaks, where there are 71,000 private emails from H.B. Gary that you can browse to your heart's content and just read everything. Among the emails they found was a PowerPoint slideshow by H.B. Gary presented to the Bank of America as to why Bank of America should hire H.B. Gary for its security needs against WikiLeaks and others saying how much H.P. Gary is ready to do computer network attack and custom malware development. You tell us who you want to hurt, H.P. Gary for the right price will do it. In fact, in this deck that was also discovered by uh, Anonymous after hacking their servers, here they are saying that for, I think the uh, price they wanted to charge was over a million dollars a month, the Bank of America, they would sow disinformation submit fake documents to WikiLeaks and then call out the error when WikiLeaks published them, other cyber attacks against their infrastructure, and a media campaign to push the radical and reckless nature, which includes attacking journalists who are supportive of WikiLeaks. So I don't feel as bad for Aaron Barr as I might otherwise. So anyway, where is all this going? I hope to establish that it's getting extremely <coughs> weird out there and that the status quo is not tenable. We are not at equilibrium. Our civic technologies are at a point where they are too easily compromised. And that the response naturally to that will 
be viewable from around our chart of the different corners of the internet. And I worry about a movement towards enclosure. So let's just look at the first chart real quick. And it is down in this corner, the why don't you take care of it yourself corner amidst the anarchy. That's the like, get a shotgun and just stay alert sort of corner. That has its limits. This is an email sent to Harvard Law School faculty and staff um, warning of an insurgence of fraudulent emails at the law school saying that if you click on the wrong link, that's it. Your entire computer is compromised. Here are all the things you need to remember to do in order to stay safe. This is my favorite. Be weary of emails that have misspellings, poor grammar, or odd characters. <laughs> I wrote back. I was like, I got one. And, uh, they sent me to Oxford for three years, so never make fun of your information technology team. Um, then you say, all right, well, let's call in the government government to help, right? This is like a problem. The government should help fix it. And the government has been aware for years that cyberspace has major vulnerabilities. They just have had a really hard time figuring out where to send the Marines. And I couldn't help them with that. I don't know where they should send the Marines to make for a more secure internet environment. So they end up with ideas like this, an IT information sharing and analysis center for which, you know, they have a bunch of monitoring equipment. And then when the internet goes down, they're like, all right, the internet's down. What do we do? We need to tell people. We can't. The internet's down. And that's it. It's really hard to know what to do. And in later versions, right, last summer we saw, well, how about a bill to let the president have emergency internet power? This bill you may have heard of, uh, called out by critics as an internet kill switch bill because the president could shut down the internet at a moment's notice, for which the senators were very upset that people were calling it that. Their best defense is here. The president has already had that authority for some time under a little-known provision of the Communications Act passed after the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. Very forward-looking Congress in 1941, <laughs> yeah. providing for an internet kill switch. But if you actually look at the amendments, yeah, it says for any wire communication service, the president can, in time of emergency, shut it down. The bill they're pushing is one for which the president can declare a cyber emergency. That's the text of the bill, cyber emergency. And when that happens, can deem certain infrastructure critical and send in the Marines to instruct whoever operates that infrastructure to do it better. <laughs> like, come on, ISP, don't be so vulnerable by order of the president. That's basically where they're at at trying to fix from the upper left quadrant these problems. And I sympathize with them how difficult it is. Within defense circles, you see the defense people saying the real problem is that we don't know where these attacks come from. And when you don't know where an attack comes from, how can you do deterrence? How can you threaten a response? How can you bring anybody to justice? You can't. So what we need, they say, is an internet in which we can know where things are coming from, which means you need to know the provenance of every bit that traverses the internet. The current internet doesn't do that. So we have groups from that quadrant. This is the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. They are very hierarchical. The only members of the union are states of the world. It's not like I can join it, but America can. Um, and the ITU has proposed that it should design a next generation network. And they've chartered something called the Focus Group on Next Generation Networks, the Figgitigitigin. And it has come together to build this. This is their vision of a next generation network, which has lots of complexity in it because it's a network that's supposed to know, even as between people using it, who they really are, even if they're trying to lie. And if they're trying to move data, if the data is labeled, don't move me, this network has to know not to move it. Oh, it's a WikiLeaks cable. I'm not going to let you download that, even though the person that has it wants to send it to you, and you want to receive it. Also note, by the way, it does connect to this little brown box called internet over here. That's the idea. The internet's still there, but no one will really use it sort of thing. The last quadrant of, um, that's been active trying to fix this is up here, the corporate quadrant, that maybe there are security solutions we can sell you that you will demand in order to make it safer. And we are starting to see that happen. I remember I had a colleague at the law school who asked me once, you know, we license our cosmetologists. Before somebody can get near your hair and shampoo it, they need a license from the state for safety. If we're willing to tolerate that, why shouldn't we license our coders? Before somebody can write code that will run on your phone or your computer, shouldn't they get a license? The answer turns out to be increasingly, that's exactly what they need. Not from the state, but they get it from uh, somebody like Apple. So for example, version one of the iPhone was 
we get to say, we, Apple, exactly what appears here. And we're going to try to make it really enticing to you, but no third-party code on the phone. It's just like the CompuServe main menu. And we don't apologize for that, because if your phone acted like a PC, believe me, I'm the guy that gave you the PC, you wouldn't like it anymore. It's going to be best efforts, and you want your phone to work all the time. That was version one of the iPhone. Now, enough people wanted to code software for the iPhone. I've got the next VisiCAD. <coughs> that Apple relented a year later and said, OK, now third parties can write code for the phone. We're going to have a software development kit. But they have to give the software to Apple and get a license. <laughs> and only when Apple says they are OK will they then have their software teed up for review, at which point it might be able to make it into the App Store, and then you can have it on your phone. And what won't we allow? Illegal, malicious, privacy, porn, bandwidth hog, and my favorite, unforeseen. We can't have anything unforeseen on the phone. Now, we don't have a ton of time, so I'll just give you one example of some of the stuff not on an iPhone near you. This is an app called Freedom Time. Um, just before the last presidential elections, it counted down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds till the end of George W. Bush's second term. Quote, till the end of an error. Denied by the iPhone App Store. Just not allowed. And the guy who actually wrote the app wrote to Steve Jobs. He was like, come on. Why won't you allow this app? And Steve Jobs writes him back and says, look, I might be a Democrat, but this is going to be offensive to roughly half our customers. What's the point? And you start to realize that when there are gatekeepers who, in their narrow work, are trying to keep you away from malware, great, I like that, they can't help but start to slide into getting rid of stuff they don't like or that they think other customers won't like and therefore you shouldn't be able to see it. And that starts to impact on the civic space. Now that's not just a story about iPhones. In my view, this is a story about all modern information technology. You add a keyboard to an iPad, guess what? That's the computer of the future. Or forget it, just keep your Mac, because now the Mac has an app store. We're just one half turn away from getting Macs that are the safest Macs ever because the only software they will run will come from the Mac App Store. And that is the computing environment of the future where you have intermediaries either on your device or out on the cloud. If somebody wants to write software today, the next VisiCalc, they're going to try to write it for an iPhone and have to clear it through Apple, or they'll write it to run on Facebook, at which point they have to clear it through Facebook. And if Facebook doesn't like it, that's it. This is Critter Island. I don't know if anybody here has played Critter Island. Looks like there's something for everybody on Critter Island. <laughs> you can't get a lot of sleep there. But it has 150 million users. They did something that Facebook didn't like. Here is their chart of usage. This is between 9 and 12 million users each day. That's Facebook saying, nah, actually, no more Critter Island. That is a new vulnerability in the network introduced through the solution to the earlier problem, which was there's too much chaos out there. We need somebody to be the conductor and lead. And in fact, in an example that could not be hypothesized as fiction until it was real, some of you may be familiar with the Kindle in which George Orwell's 1984 was made available by Amazon at 99 cents a copy. They thought it was out of copyright, which it is in Canada. It's not out of copyright in the United States, which they belatedly found out after they had sold a bunch of them. They panicked. They stopped selling it. Guess what else they did? They reached in to every single Kindle that had bought 1984 and deleted it off the Kindle. Which, I mean, could you pick a better book for which this could happen? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you don't have 1984. You never had 1984. <laughs> there is no such book as 1984. And it's like, again, like if I were to just offer that up as, did you know they could do this and use this as an example, you'd be like, come on, oh, it's all right, it's Orwellian. Like, no, it is Orwellian. Is it in fact Orwellian situation? Now, it's funny because we're still in a transitionary time. If it's not on the Kindle, fine. We get it from the library or Wordsworth or you name it. This is 02138, baby. But that is transitionary. As we move to the Kindle and to the Google Books situation, where everything is online and you get to it through a window, what's to stop somebody from telling Google Books, get rid of the book? Or, I have a court order. This is defamatory. This is copyright infringing. Get rid of that line. And what's Google? They might be on our side, but, you know, they have assets. They're like, well, all right, I guess we get rid of it. I'm not against the Google Books project. I'm not against the Kindle. 
But as we build in levels of control, in part to answer the security vulnerability of the original civic technologies, I don't want to see us giving away certain freedoms through our market actions that we would otherwise have. Uh, I had a toaster here because I was just trying to hypothesize the, um, uh, the kind of non-civic web-enabled toaster of tomorrow. And, you know, it's like this is what it looks like on Monday morning. And then on Tuesday you come in and it's like, congratulations, you got the May update. You now have three slots. Like, okay, I've now got three slots in my toaster. <laughs> you come back in the afternoon, it's like, sorry, there was a bug, we rolled it back, we apologize for any toast that was crushed, but you'd have two again. Uh -huh. Like, okay. Then on Thursday, you come down and it's making orange juice. Uh -huh. And at that point, you're like, what did I buy? I thought I bought a toaster. <laughs> no, you didn't buy a toaster. You've entered into a long-term relationship with a breakfast-oriented service provider. <laughs> and all it wants to do is help you. Like, they want you to be happy. That's why it's making orange juice. But it's a very contingent way of viewing the world than our world of things had been before. So let me just say a couple words about what to do about it, and then uh, I think we'll have 30 minutes left for uh, discussion. My hope is to change this movement towards enclosure to what I call a movement towards renewal to actually see if we can harness civic technologies and the people we can attract to them to help defend civic technologies. And that's a very distinct kind of leadership in the world. And we're talking about <coughs> stuff that's in, really, the bottom left, the fourth quadrant here. This is the quadrant we haven't explored. We've looked at having your own shotgun to defend yourself and having the government come in and send the Marines and then having the corporations offer levels of security that you pay for, like little private mercenaries. You know, you, you need help on the road between the Baghdad airport and Baghdad? Write us a check and we'll protect you. But that has its own disadvantages. What might this quadrant offer is sort of the question I want to ask. And for that, I think about, metaphorically, some crazy experiments done by this guy, Hans Mondermann, um, from the Netherlands, who came up with something called, and I'm going to, not get the name pronounced right, but in Dutch it's Verkeersbridge. Um, it means unsafe is safe. And uh, it's, a, it's a philosophy of open spaces. And he had the counterintuitive idea uh, of taking all of the signs and rules and eliminating them. And actually just making a much more basic open space. This is his experiment being tried in South Kensington in London. Uh, it was also tried in the town of Drochten in the Netherlands. And they just changed the rules to be um, don't park your car where it would block another car or be in a weird place. Um, be mindful and uh, uh, drive reasonably. And what they found was that both the vehicular and pedestrian accident rates plummeted where this was introduced in Drockton and in Kensington. And they found that drivers had to be much more attentive. They were not texting or using their computers because there was much more uncertainty about what was about to happen. It also meant they were making more eye contact with people. So they'd see the bicyclist and have to make eye contact, and one would just say, no, go ahead, you go ahead. And it would actually be a moment not of road rage, but of road calming. Now, I'm not sure this could work everywhere, right? You can't introduce this overnight in Mexico City. But it says that at least under some circumstances, by removing the first quadrant's push, something comes to fill the void, especially when we all share a stake in it working well. So I told you I would give you the bookend to this story of the blocking of uh, YouTube around the world by this Pakistani ISP. So here's what happened. There's a group called NANOG, the North American Network Operators Group. It's not incorporated. It has no president. It's a mailing list. Any one of us could join it at any time. It's basically people who on a nice day would rather be inside in a windowless room typing in non-proportional font about what's going on on the internet. And some of them are employees at ISPs. This is the key Nanog message that says, YouTube has been hijacked by Pakistan. This is not a drill. And the people on Nanog are writing back and forth, are you sure? Okay, you're right. I'm confirming it too. How do we deal with this? And the mid-level employees at ISPs among them say, well, I could manually reconfigure my routers to ignore this spurious piece of data and announce where YouTube really is. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that too. And before you knew it, you had a critical mass of ISPs announcing the real YouTube, drowning out the falsehood of the fake YouTube, and YouTube was back up and running. 
It's like your house catches on fire, and the bad news is there's no fire department. The good news is people materialize out of nowhere, put out the fire, and leave without expecting payment or praise. Mm. That's what happened, right? It's not even like Nanog has a schedule, like a call sheet or call log, so that they know somebody's watching the network at all times. It just naturally works that way, which also makes you realize that if there were a particularly good Star Trek reunion convention at one point, the internet would stand defenseless because nobody would be at Nanog keeping an eye on things. <laughs> so I was trying to think of the right metaphor for this kind of defense thing. And like, this is the best I can come up with, right? And in a school of governance, this is a weird metaphor to celebrate because Batman is extra legal. On the other hand, he's about just getting the job done and we rely on him to protect us and he could be any of us. He wears that mask. And when you look at Wikipedia, you see the same thing. Stuff could be vandalized all the time on Wikipedia. Spammers might want to turn every page into an ad for a Rolex watch. Believe me, they do. They're the same people that make 99% of email ads for Rolex watches. But Wikipedia has a notice board, which is itself a page that anybody can edit, and it includes one problem after another that people bring to the self-described editors and administrators. What keeps Wikipedia afloat? is that there are more people at all times reading this page to fix the problems reported there than there are problems on the page. Mm. At any point, people just got bored and weren't doing that anymore, Wikipedia would be a wasteland in a matter of 12 to 24 hours. That's a powerful force that I say we might be able to harness in any number of ways. Mm. And so the framework I want to urge as I think about leadership in this space is one of mutual aid, almost like a NATO for cyberspace. In what way can we have all of us who share an interest in keeping things up and running working together to make stuff better? Now, we saw across the Middle East the ways in which social media have had some role in facilitating people, organizing and spreading their message, and in this case, thanking Facebook for it. We've also seen the ways in which governments have tried to pressure information technology providers not to be so helpful. This is actually a message sent through Vodafone. The armed forces asked Egypt's honest and loyal men to confront the traitors and criminals and protect our people and honor in our precious Egypt. This is before Mubarak fell. Vodafone was forced to send that text to one phone after another. Not that it worked, but that's what they were trying to do. So I see ways of mutual aid among the companies that might be so asked to do it. This is a global network initiative where companies are trying to get together and see how to make a common response to demands like that when they should arise. And I see services, uh, for which I'm a part of this, Herdict, Verdict of the Herd, where together we report what websites we can and can't get to. And for the first time, we have a public emerging map in real time of what's getting blocked and what's not around the world. That has not existed before. One way to make it exist is to build it literally ourselves, to have enough people be willing to help report when they can't get somewhere that now we've got ongoing reports. And when something like this happens, this is Egypt pulling the plug on the internet entirely, there might be mutual aid solutions as well. So the things called ad hoc mesh networks. Within this room, there are a bunch of two-way radios. If the Kennedy School wireless went down, and so did the AT&T tower nearby, so now you've got a, a, a brick, it's still a two-way radio. It could talk to all the other bricks in this room. And if one person is still connected through Verizon or I don't know, I think there's probably one T-Mobile user in the room. We could all together go through that for a bit and get through the crisis all having connectivity. And we've seen software written to let people, in this case, not report network outages like Herdic does, but report trouble spots here in Haiti after the earthquake. This is something called Ushahidi, where people talk about various problems, and now you can map them in real time as they're happening without there having to be one public authority up and running ready to operate 911. In fact, there are projects, this is called the Freedom Box Project, to allow people to have servers wherever they may be so that you don't have to rely on Facebook or even the Ushahidi server to make a report, but instead you could run software. One example is called Diaspora. This is Facebook, but distributed. So if we're in Tahrir Square together, and we can connect to one another because we've got a lot of mobile phones, but they've thrown the kill switch and we can't get to California to talk to Facebook.com, one of us can run Diaspora, and now we've got social networking within this group. And it doesn't matter that the group can't even communicate outside the square. 
I believe these are the kinds of things we are going to see happening um, as the internet matures and faces these problems. I have another idea that I can maybe explain in conversation. I won't go through it now, but it also has to do with mutual aid among web servers, basically, so that if they get subject to a denial of service attack, there's an easy way for other web servers to help them out. And I'll sign up my web server to help because I might be the next victim. And if I sign up to help them, they're going to sign up mutually to help me. And all of a sudden, I am much more difficult to attack. Believe me, it's much more simple than all the arrows make it look. <laughs> to wrap up, there was a time when hitchhiking was a perfectly sensible thing to do. Talk about a civic technology. It's just like, you know, you've got a car and an empty seat, and I'm a person. <laughs> like, what better combination could there be? <laughs> and it worked until it didn't. I don't know. Like, given this room, how many people have hitchhiked? It's a lot. How many people have hitchhiked within the past two years? All right, a couple crazy people, but the rest of us not. The slug lies in D.C. That's a great example of blessing by the first quadrant over something that emerged from the fourth. Great possibilities there and good leadership. It's just hitchhiking itself has gotten a pretty bad reputation. By renaming it slug lines, oh, that's not hitchhiking. That's like there's a designated lane. You change the frame. And sure enough, Craigslist has changed the frame. There's rideshare on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. And like, what is rideshare but hitchhiking? It wasn't like, we don't think that killers plan ahead. Like, they would never use Craigslist. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. It's just, it's not hitchhiking. I'm going to give it a try until it doesn't work, just like I walk outside and I don't get hit by a car most of the time. That's the kind of thing that suggests a renewal of the civic spirit that turns out to be so important. And I end up thinking of this guy who basically, right, are you coming to bed? I can't. This is important. Hmm. What? Someone is wrong on the internet. <laughs> I've got to set them straight. Yeah. That is an atomic energy source that at each of the layers, the content layer of Wikipedia, the application layer, uh, the mutual aid layers of, of mesh networks, can help us get through what otherwise are going to be really tough times ahead. So I feel like the bat signal is up and waiting for us, regardless of our nerdiness level to pitch in here at one place or another, and it's how we choose to answer that call that in turn is a description of leadership in a networked world. Wow. Thank you. The floor is open. You talk about the <clears throat> Mac store being kind of obviously controlled by Apple. So what do you think of the <coughs> same kind of Facebook platform where Facebook can you know, determine freedom of speech? Because when we had the CEO talking to us, she said they tried not to do that. But then in the press, I've kind of heard yeah. you know, more and more about it. So I just wondered what you thought. I think it's really hard to expect a tiger to act like a kitten. So no matter the best intentions or even pressures put upon Facebook to respect what we would think of as sort of free speech norms, for one thing, because they're in quadrant two and not quadrant one, they're in the corporate quadrant, under our traditional frameworks, uh, there is, um, they're not a, a state actor. They're not the government. So if they choose to shut down a group, it's entirely up to them. It's a customer service issue, not a free speech issue, even though it might impact speech far more than whether or not you're allowed to unfurl a <coughs> banner in the park in front of the Kennedy School. Um, and I almost think about it like I think of Bitly. It's not as if the Facebook messaging group software is all that. I still haven't figured out Facebook groups. They're really not that great. So why are we using them? Why would we introduce this kind of vulnerability and then be shocked, shocked, when Facebook under pressure or under court order or for any other reason decides to shut down a group, when we could build or find services that are more amenable to the kinds of speech we want to do? Now, Facebook is generative. Make no mistake. When they built Facebook, they weren't thinking of Tahrir Square or political speech. In fact, I remember in the fall of 2007 earnestly asking the chief privacy officer of Facebook at the time, I was like, so are you guys thinking of going beyond schools? Are you thinking like anybody might join Facebook? Or are you going to keep it with universities and schools? Like that was not a crazy question to ask in the fall of 07. It was not that far away. And by the way, his answer was yes, yes, we're going beyond schools. So yes. Um, so I find your proposition that we should all be trying to be like a Batman and then we 
<laughs> but I'm wondering, um, can that kind of civic spirit, um, is it something that could be cultivated? Uh, or and, and what are the motivations behind those people who are trying to enforce their own rules? For example, like the ones that you talked about, the battle. Yes. Um, are they doing it just for fun or are they doing it for some kind of altruism? Or yes. Or there, could there be any incentives to build on that? Those are great and deep questions. And there are ways to answer them quickly and casually. And there are writers and thinkers who have done so to great effect. There's a good reason to want to get an answer sooner rather than better. Um, there are also reasons to really want to try to get that right and to delve into it. So for instance, people who think about motivation talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Are you being motivated by money or by fun or by altruism? And some, but not all, see a difference between somebody motivated by altruism and somebody motivated by money. And there have even been experiments far away from the internet space where it turns out blood that is paid for by a blood bank is of lower quality, has more disease in it, and needs to be thrown away than blood that is given, which defies market expectations. Normally, the more you pay for something, you'd think the better the quality would be. And that invites us to look more closely at the huge landscape of the internet and say, for something like Wikipedia, that at least for the moment is a real success along several dimensions, what motivates them? How many are there? How do they recruit new Wikipedians? Answer very painfully and slowly. Because for some of these things, you said a great thing at the beginning of your question, there's a culture here. And a culture requires a form of apprenticeship and immersion rather than a manual of how to succeed in that culture. And the best ones invite new people in by giving them a runway that they can go down so that when they make mistakes or do something that isn't part of that culture, they're not told they're terrible and kicked out immediately, but they're given opportunity to explore why something else might have been better and see if they still resonate with the culture as they learn it. Wikipedia tries to do that. Nanog tries to do it. And it's a struggle between how much of a backwater do we want to stay versus how much do we want Wikipedia to be in the curriculum of the public schools, not assignment to draw from Wikipedia for your book report, but have your book report be a contribution to Wikipedia rather than a report given to a teacher and graded. If they're going to do that, that really could be a struggle for their culture. I think almost of um, in the early 90s, the question of was China going to annex Hong Kong or was Hong Kong going to annex China? That kind of question as the lease by Britain um, was about to, to give up. So very complex questions, ones for which it's just great to look at the answers that are emerging. Some of them I should also add hybrid. When people participate on Yelp or TripAdvisor, I don't know how many people have read or contributed a Yelp review or a TripAdvisor review. It's run by a dot-com. It's not like these are people that want to somehow make the world a better reviewed place for its own sake. It's a business idea. But we kind of suspend that disbelief and don't expect payment ourselves. We'll accept a Yelp Elite badge or a pair of owl glasses or something on TripAdvisor when you do well. And there's some question there. And that's why for Wikipedia it's actually interesting. You don't say I'm a volunteer at Wikipedia or I'm a Wikipedia user. You say I'm a Wikipedian. You are Wikipedia in a way that TripAdvisor people aren't really TripAdvisor and Yelp, Yelpers somewhere uh, in the middle. So there are formulas to be discovered on how to draw people most effectively to these civic uh, enterprises. I wanted to ask you, I've got a number of questions. Let me ask you this question for starters. Uh, we have developed uh, in the international community a, a set of norms about uh, human rights in countries. What, you know, what, it is permissible now for the international community to intervene if there's genocide within a country. Yes. Should we be thinking about a set of norms about how countries can use the internet to tyrannize their citizens, to invade their privacy, to spy on them, to a variety of things, and then what steps could be taken or should be taken? Yes. I think trying to develop such norms is worthy. They can run into the same barriers that human rights norms run into, where when something's happening, all right, who's going to enforce it? Is it ultimately unilateral or regional or something like that? <coughs> Libya being not a bad uh, case in point. 
in the internet space, it may turn out that the primary players, the ones who could be influenced by such norms and who, if they bought into them and even committed to them, could make a difference in enforcing them, are the companies. It's the second quadrant, the corporate sector. The Global Network Initiative I only briefly mentioned, it was started in part, its charter corporate members were Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, um, and I think maybe Vodafone, I forget if they ultimately joined. Um, but Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo were the, the anchor stores. And you'd think, that's not a bad start. That makes it serious. Nobody else wants to join. Cisco doesn't want to join. Little companies don't want to join. Because by even affiliating yourself with a norms-producing body might make China mad at you, as evidenced by you're simply not getting that license you wanted or having network connectivity that ought to be working, but it isn't. But there's nobody to go to to say, oh, was it GNI that did it? So um, it has been tricky as GNI has not only tried to solicit members, but then tried to come up with what would the right norms be? What behaviors are behaviors for at least we don't want, as companies chartered in societies that do embrace the rule of law, we don't want to be part of that, either because of our own altruism or because, like Nike and sweatshops, we'll get bad publicity if we are part of that. It's been a very difficult process to agree upon it. I wouldn't say it's been a futile one. I think the world is better off with GNI, but I am also, I'm not thinking it's going to be an easy march to actually develop these norms and get them enforced routinely, even by so these companies. So I think if we're in a situation where a, a government, the U.S. government, could put pressure on a company. Yes. It could shame them into doing things. That's the, um, right. that's the WikiLeaks Amazon example. Right. Right. But you, if there were something happening in China and, and, or in a, an authoritarian society to which the U.S. or the U.N. objected, the UN could take a stand and that company would be under enormous pressure. It might be under some pressure. And in fact, within US circles, there's been legislation that's never gotten beyond committee, um, pushed mostly by what you, you could call hawks or human, right hawk, human rights hawks um, for a Global Internet Freedom Act, which would have the State Department maintain a list of internet freedom repressing countries. And if a country is on the list, then certain um, limitations kick in as to how American companies or any company under the American jurisdiction has to um, work with those countries. And what we've seen are the companies have not been that excited about it for probably obvious reasons. Although there is something roughly analogous called the um, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA, which for instance doesn't allow American companies or anybody under U.S. jurisdiction to bribe foreign officials. And often bribery is a way of getting things done. It's just expected. Companies are of a mixed view as to whether they like the GF, uh, the, the, the um, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the FCPA, because it lets them say to the person expecting the bribe, I'd love to, but I can't. I'll get punished at home. See, there's this law. It's kind of a nice hands tying exercise. On the other hand, if others aren't so limited, it might mean that they'll lose that bid or that license. So at least those companies that might be subject to these restrictions they're hoping that the restrictions will be as broad as possible so their competitors have to live under them, too. Do you think we're moving toward a period in which uh, the, the Internet and all the technologies associated are going to mean more freedom for people or less freedom for people? The world? That's a, another great question. Um, and it's particularly difficult, as we at the OpenNet Initiative have tried to do an assessment on a country-by-country -country basis of how Internet freedom respecting they are, We've even tried to figure out, can we assign a single axis and number to that, or do we have to break it out into subzones and maybe reflect that they're very free on this part but not on another? In fact, some have said, uh, well, the United States doesn't have a lot of technical filtering. When you ask to go to a website in the U.S., it tries to get you there. There's no government trying to stop you. But there are legal restrictions that the FBI might arrest you for downloading that music or... Um, engaging in that defamation? Or shouldn't those restrictions be thought of as internet freedom restrictions, even though they're not literally affecting how you use the internet? Our answer has been maybe so. We'll try to be comprehensive in our country by country analyses and say. Now, to more directly answer your question, I believe that overall the slope of the curve is positive. Whether you are in America or in China, or I don't know about Libya at the moment, but let's say Egypt. The amount of information you have access to, 
the number of opportunities to engage with fellow citizens and people around the world in an unfettered way is greater today than it was yesterday. And that is then a generally optimistic story, that they can huff and puff, but the internet is basically pushing towards freedom. The caveat I attach to that is grounded in the tectonic shifts happening in internet technology. That the technologies we will use to access and enjoy the internet are not going to be the same five or ten years from now than they are right now. And those technologies could be evolving in a way that could amount to a curve that goes up, 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 and then suddenly gets to a different place. So for example, um, the 1984 being taken off the Kindles, it's still easier and cheaper to get your eyes reading 1984 today than it has been the day before, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know what? Five or ten years from now, if Google Books takes off as we and they want it to, it might be easier to get people away from 1984 on a given Tuesday when the previous day there was more access than ever before because we're all using cloud access to get to one approved copy. We're not bothering to download it because it's always there for us and never need it. Why? How paranoid to make your own copy at home uh, of stuff. It's like insisting on having an answering machine because voicemail, I don't know where that is. You know, you sound like a tinfoil guy. Um, but you could see it change in a heartbeat. That's what really worries me. That's the wild card in what is otherwise a story of increasing internet freedom. Yes, sir. What about like the issue of uh, your own personal privacy and like you're saying the, uh, that, that specific individual, he was uh, exploited and all of this information went out there. Yes. I, I, everybody could easily, you know, like who, who can see what you have and all that stuff. Yeah, your best defense against those kinds of privacy invasions turns out to be, I'm just a grain of sand on the beach of equal disinterest to the world and the rest of the sand, so I'm just going to keep on keeping on despite the fact that I'm living a nominally transparent life. Mm -hmm. For the kinds of privacy invasions that we've gotten familiar with hearing scare stories about, so familiar that we're almost resigned to them, corporate invasions of privacy, of abusing the information we give them, or you know, targeted advertising, all that kind of stuff, or government intrusions that, wait a minute, without a warrant, they're listening into what? I feel like we already have the tools by which to push back against that if we cared enough. There is an ACLU out there, and if enough people got outraged, particular provisions of law would be tweaked in a society like ours to try to get around those abuses. Um, what interests me here, though, is just like the answer to the last question, which is, are there tectonic major movements that could affect the way we think of privacy? And I think the answer there is yes, and I'll give you a couple quick examples. Um, Right now, if you have a smartphone on you, chances are good you're pretty much addicted. I use it in the colloquial, not the clinical sense. But like <laughs> this nice lady is, you know, checking her iPhone right now because you know there might be email coming in that's marginally more interesting than what's happening now, and you've got to get it. I, I totally. Or maybe you had to check in on Foursquare to like alert people that you were in this room. Who knows? It's easy to say because all of us pretty much do that. But imagine now that addiction harnessed to something far more tempting um, and uh, crossed basically with our desire to earn frequent flyer miles or people go to great lengths to earn frequent flyer miles. I was actually, I hope we have the time for this brief story. I was on a, um, going to take a puddle jumper flight from LA to San Diego um, to, to, to get to a conference and they had a problem with the plane. So they, they said, we, we've got a bus outside. We're going to bus you to San Diego. And it was like late December. And half of the people on this flight were like, no, no, I need my frequent flyer miles. The only reason I'm taking this flight is to be put over the top with 500 minimum miles to earn my next tier. Do I get the miles if I take the bus? And they conferred. and They're like, okay, you'll get the miles if you take the bus. Like, well, actually, I was just going to take a round trip. I don't need to go to San Diego. Can you just give me the miles and you don't have to bus me? <laughs> no, you better ride the bus. So anyway, <laughs> people like miles and they like points. So just imagine a platform of the very near future. You're walking down the street, strolling down Brattle, and the phone vibrates. You check it. It says, within 20 yards of you, there is an opportunity to score, you name your currency. Real money, 50 cents, or acorns, or 500 frequent flyer miles. All we ask is that you go take a picture of the house from the designated location. 
that you see. Take the picture, hit send, it goes to some anonymous person, thank you, here's your 50 cents. Lather, rinse, repeat. We now have a great private investigatory or public investigatory mechanism where tourists walking up and down the street, all of a sudden, half of them, each pull out a camera, take a picture. If you're living inside that house, What's going on? You could run outside, shake somebody by the lapels. Why did you just take a picture of my house? Like, because somebody paid me 50 cents. Well, let me see. What's the, here's the picture, but I don't know where it went. I don't know who paid me. I know nothing except that there is now the greatest surveillance network available in the world. Talk about extrinsic motivation, 50 cents and acorns. And we didn't require a Stasi or extra hire on the FBI payroll to make it happen. That's an example of a privacy invasion for which I don't even know where to start. And this is not on the ACLU's radar. And trust me, it's not tinfoil hat. We've got all the ingredients ready. And for those of you who use Foursquare or Gowalla or otherwise earning mayorships and points, this is just part of the game. So I look at that. I look at um, the fact that the location of a photo gets naturally embedded in the photo, watermarked as a convenience. But up on Flickr now, somebody can go to somebody's Flickr account and trace exactly where they've been just by using that data. In fact, there's a um, program you can download called Creepy. That's actually the Google Creepy program. It will, you just give it somebody's Facebook account, Twitter account, and you know, all the usual things. Not the passwords to it, just what's available to you as somebody who's friended them. And it will create a map of where they've been at all times on any geolocating tidbits that it gets. And they've all voluntarily shared it. They just didn't realize what could be done with it. So I see great privacy challenges ahead that are nothing like the privacy challenges we think of when we think privacy. And I'm eager to get to work on those and let the ACLU fight the losing rear guard action against the other privacy stuff. I yeah. guess on that note, too, what about the uh, Google Earth? You know, where you can, I mean, I can go see my parents' house and I can see if their car's out front. And I mean, that's not that creepy because they're my parents and they're yeah. not trying to get away from me. But I think that, you know, there are like other elements of that that, it, that even freak me out. I mean, I'm all over Facebook, but yeah. I, you know, I worry a lot about it. Well, and the great thing about that is it's still very 1.0 in that Google has sent trucks. Only Google would do this. Let's just put cameras on top of trucks and drive down every street in America and collect the pictures. <laughs> And like, no one else thought to do that. They're like, eh, it wouldn't cost that much. That you could see, as Europe has done in some places, banning the trucks. Or sometimes the villagers come out with pitchforks and stab the trucks. Um, <laughs> it happened in an English hamlet. Um, <laughs> but what happens when my example of the get 50 cents to take a picture was assuming great interest in that one location. What if it's just, I want to redo the Google Street Maps through completely distributed means? First person to take a good picture from this corner gets 50 cents, all others don't. There's a race to take the pictures. And the kind of people that might be collecting cans are now taking pictures down the way. How much quicker and cheaper could you do street view? And how much harder would it be to regulate when you can't say somebody with a truck with a camera can't do X? That is the delta. I should also add, too, I see our technological revolutions as basically being in three parts. The first was cheap processors. It got really cheap to have a personal computer and have decent processor without having the timeshare on a VAX. That's the 70s and the 80s. Then came cheap networks. That's the 90s and the 2000s, where the price of actually being online went down so far that it actually makes economic sense to have the Somerset wheel of cheese cam in Somerset, England, where you can watch live in high definition a wheel of cheese ripen. And people tune in, and there's a ton of bandwidth use to just watch this wheel of cheese sit there. It's like, we can afford that now in a way that some of us remember long distance international phone calls. You'd make your little agenda ahead of time because it was so expensive per minute. That's cheap networks. That's having huge implications, including of the sort that I talked about with ad hoc mesh. The third is cheap sensors. It's suddenly trivial to just as an afterthought, throw a camera on the front and back of your iPhone or your Android phone or your iPad. And now people that normally wouldn't be carrying around cameras are, and when anything of the remotest interest happens, they're filming it. And you know, because if you go onto YouTube and you just put into YouTube angry teacher or road rage, you will see one incident after another that is in public but private, no longer private, because it was in public and somebody was there to catch it. I think that one step further with cheap sensors is for anybody that has ever had atrial fibrillation or um, any health issue, 
monitoring blood pressure, glucose levels. How soon till we just have that done 24-7, like the black box of an airplane, and if anything goes wrong, it sends it back to the hospital, and then the hospital makes anonymous use of the data the way that Google makes anonymous use of all the searches, so that Google Trends for flu can tell you if Cambridge is getting sick because of the number of Googles for Robitussin taking place disproportionately from Cambridge IP addresses. Now we can tell if Cambridge is getting nervous. There's something going on in Cambridge. Oh, that's right, there's a Red Sox game. That's why the entire town is reporting a slightly higher blood pressure rate. That's, that's the kind of data that we will soon be routinely collecting for which things are going to get weird, and it'll be playful, just like Google Flu Trends is both playful and maybe helpful to public health. It'll be playful and helpful to public health, and if there's an accident or disaster, even knowing where people are, think about after Hurricane Katrina, could be great. It'll make Hurricane Katrina look like it took place in the Stone Age. But then you start to get to, wait a minute, it looks like the lid is boiling over in Tahrir Square. We'd better intervene as the government now that we see through completely anonymously collected data that the natives are getting restless. These are the kinds of things that keep me a little bit awake at night. How much time, just, just as a matter of personal curious, how much time do you spend <laughs> for, you know, just with the internet, with these technologies every day? I like to tell myself it's all research, but yeah. um, a lot, a lot. And it's true and you, that... I mean, you, you have to know this terrain so well in order to... And in fact, for me, this is a very specific answer to your question, but at some point somebody came along just like Tim Berners-Lee came along and invented the World Wide Web, and there it is. There was no gatekeeper. It just got invented. Somebody invented something called RSS, really simple syndication. So that instead of going to a bunch of websites that you might frequent, including blogs and collecting a little news here and a little news there, it was a way of going to one place or having one device that would draw from all of your many news sources and keep track, like with points, of how many items you had unread. Completely changed how I consume what I know about the Internet. And I now have kind of a constant stream of what could be to-dos in order to stay on top of something. If I haven't read all of the slash dot stuff from the day, somebody will ask me a question, I won't be on top of it. That creates scalability problems. And that means not a policy issue now, just a very personal one. Like everyone else or many other people, I'm struggling with what to do with information flows where I can't easily scale me and how to deal with email and blogs and everything else for which I really, once I read it, I'm glad I read it. I, it's not like it was a waste of my time, but I only have so much of it. It's a real problem. Well, John, thank you for the time you gave here. Thank you.